this edition of Primetime News. With the end of the first round of family reunions for Korean families torn apart by war set to wrap up on Thursday, hours feel like minutes as the participants try to make the most of what could be their last get-together. While agreeing with President Bakunet's viewpoint of a need to improve frosty ties, Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe shows the opposite meaning by sending tributes to a shrine that glorifies war criminals. Sports having already beaten world football powerhouse Brazil at the Under-17 World Cup, Team Korea is on a roll, this time downing Guinea. It's 10 p.m. on a Wednesday here in Korea. Welcome to Primetime News. I'm Daniel Che. Our starting point is again the reunion for families separated by the Korean War. Today, the participants got to spill their hearts out behind closed doors, safe from prying eyes of authorities and the media. A sleepless night is a given, though, as they will have to say goodbye, possibly for the last time in their lives come tomorrow morning. Connie Kim has more on the second emotional day at the Mount Kumgang Resort in North Korea. Families hold toasts celebrating their second meal together. They share food with their loved ones for once and eventually break into tears. Tears of happiness and joy. <laughs> Hands are tightly held, not missing a moment of this precious time together. Unlike yesterday's rush of emotions, families seem to have gotten a lot closer on the second day of reunions. A lot of them say they feel they have bonded, especially after sharing personal stories during closed-door individual meetings. One family even takes time to record a video message to some absent members living in Brazil. <laughs> Gifts were exchanged as well. North Korean liquor, tablecloths, and scarves. Priceless presents a South Korean families will keep forever. But as the families meet again for their group meeting in the afternoon, they feel time is running out quickly and they spend every minute they have left. It's a house their family used to live together decades ago. Lee Jong Suk asks her father to sing his favorite song. It's a melody she has long been wanting to hear for years. <laughs> Looking at photographs and recalling memories, war-torn families spend time catching up after all those decades apart. But they can't help to wish they could spend more time together. <laughs> Spending their last night together in North Korea, not knowing when they'll see each other again after being separated for more than half a century, families are preparing for another tearful and painful goodbye. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Let's move on to other stories now. Leaders of both Korea and Japan have expressed hopes of improving bilateral relations. A much-needed change as the relationship soured quite a bit due to historical issues. Hwang sang looks into whether we can reach a turning point to improve these ties. Last week in Washington, President Park expressed hopes for a more amicable future with Japan. 
On Wednesday, in a video message to a Korea-Japan friendship meeting in Seoul, she reiterated that the two neighbors should move toward a new future based on the spirit of a correct sense of history and friendship. Korea-Japan relations are at a historic low, as Tokyo continues denying its historical wrongdoings, including its wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. This has kept the two leaders from holding a summit since both of them took office. Yet, in a video message for the same event, Prime Minister Abe said he hopes to further improve Japan's ties with Korea, calling it one of Japan's most important partners. But on Sunday, Abe made an offering at the controversial Yasukuni War Shrine, raising doubts about his sincerity. The shrine honors millions of Japan's war dead, including Class A war criminals, and any action to pay tribute there by the Japanese leadership frustrates Korea. All this comes less than two weeks before Seoul hosts a trilateral summit with Tokyo and Beijing, where President Park and Abe are expected to hold their first summit. But Abe's contradictory actions and words keep many skeptical about how much progress will be made in thawing the current frosty bilateral relations. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. And even though South Korea reiterated its stance on Japan needing prior approval when deploying its troops to North Korea during wartime, Japanese media says that South Korea has no jurisdiction in the communist regime and thus Japan needs no approval from Seoul. Kim Yeon-bin reports. Several Japanese news outlets reported on Wednesday that Tokyo does not need Seoul's prior approval if sending its self-defense forces to North Korea during wartime. Japan's Nihon Geisai Shimbun stated that South Korea's jurisdiction lies south of the border and that Japan does not have to seek Seoul's approval to send troops into North Korea. Japan's Asahi Shimbun also reported that South Korea's defense minister Han min koo tried to emphasize that Japan needs to seek approval but failed to mention whether North Korea was part of the country's jurisdiction. The reports come a day after South Korea's defense minister Han min koo held rare talks with his Japanese counterpart Ken Nakatani on Tuesday. Han reaffirmed Korea's stance that Japan needs prior approval before deploying any Japanese forces to the Korean Peninsula, as North Korea is considered South Korean territory under constitutional law. But instead, Nakatani replied, saying Tokyo would abide by international law, which sees North Korea as a separate nation. Experts believe the involvement of Japanese troops in the communist regime during wartime will likely be the focus of trilateral defense talks between Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington in the future. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. The United States says it has no interest in peace treaty talks with North Korea, at least not without the regime's full and verifiable denuclearization. Oh Se Young has more on how the U.S. plans to pull out all the stops to keep the rogue state in check. At a hearing of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Tuesday local time, Washington's chief envoy to the six-party nuclear talk, Sung Kim, reaffirmed that the Obama administration's main focus is on North Korea's denuclearization. The U.S. officials' remarks come after Pyongyang last week and repeated its desire to hold peace talks with Washington. The regime, however, rejected the idea of giving up his nuclear program. It declared that only trust between the two countries could remove the roots of war and end the nuclear competition between them. The U.S. Special Envoy dismissed the demand, saying a nuclear-free Korean peninsula should be prioritized above all else. Kim said North Korea had neglected its commitments to the international community by continuing to pursue a nuclear weapons program. The DPRK continues to violate its commitments and international obligations and continues to pursue nuclear weapons and their means of delivery as a strategic national priority, all at the cost of the well-being of its own people and while perpetrating horrific human rights abuses against them. The U.S. official also said Washington would use everything in its means to make the North realize that it can't achieve the security and prosperity it craves while it continues to stock up on nuclear weapons. Kim added that diplomatic coordination and sustained pressure through international sanctions should be used to keep the regime in line. Oh Seung, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the South Korean Defense Intelligence Agency says that North Korea's submarine launched ballistic missiles technology is not ready yet. According to the KDIA on Wednesday, it will take up to five years to complete the technology and at best three years if the communist regime pushes ahead full throttle with its plan. 
The agency added despite claims from Pyongyang, both Seoul and Washington found no evidence that the reclusive state has successfully miniaturized its nuclear warhead. According to Korea's finance minister, labor market reforms will, in the long run, benefit society as a whole. Speaking at a job fair, Minister Che Kyung-hwan said that reforms will be a win-win for everyone as they will lift the country's growth potential and boost employment opportunities. Che said the current labor market structure is outdated and in need of fixing. Last month, representatives from labor, management and government reached an agreement that revises the country's labor law to make it easier for employers to fire underperforming workers as well as change the rules of employment. In a separate meeting with small business operators, the minister explained that reducing the country's working hours will also bring benefits such as job creation and enhancing the quality of life. The driving force behind economic growth here in Korea, backed by the country's largest conglomerates, is slowly waning. A trend that's spurring worries that heavy reliance on mega corporations could seriously challenge the local economy. Our Shin Zemin has this report. An economy dependent on mega conglomerates. Korea's top 30 business groups generated 207 trillion won, or over 183 billion U.S. dollars in value added last year. But that's down 0.6 percent from the year before, signaling trouble. A report by CEO Score, an online corporate productivity evaluation company, indicates the value added by all business units of the largest 30 conglomerates backtracked by half a percentage point in GDP contribution. What used to stand at over 15 percent last year ticked down to 14.6 percent. This comes as performance at the country's leading firms has sunk on the back of slowing demand both home and abroad. The total value added includes net profits, labor and rental costs, as well as depreciated costs. By firms, Samsung Group registered the largest amount in value added at nearly $60 billion. Its leading arm, Samsung Electronics, posted $34 billion, a near 14 percent drop on year, dragging down the country's GDP by 0.45 percent. Hyundai Motor and POSCO generated nearly $30 and $7 billion, respectively. Ultimately, it boils down to creating new industries that will drive up growth. And we can see that happen by reforming the structure of sectors so that firms across the board can prosper evenly. Citing Nokia and the blow it dealt to the Finnish economy, experts say relying on the success of large corporations cannot sustain the local economy in the long run, adding that a structural transformation should take place as early as possible. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. The new look tech warriors are looking good. Team Korea is looking invincible with another victory at the FIFA Under-17 World Cup in Chile Tuesday. The junior tech warriors defeated Guinea, inking the stat sheets minutes before time expired, courtesy of Oh Se-hun's net scorcher. With the win, Korea secures a ticket to the Sweet 16, regardless of the result against England in their final group match Friday. This is the first time Korea won the first two games of the group stage at a FIFA men's competition. What's noteworthy is their opening win came at the expense of world football powerhouse Brazil. If Korea wins Group B, they will face one of the third place seats. Team Korea will face the runner up from Group F if they finish second in the group. Today marks the 2015 Hanbok Day, which celebrates Korea's traditional outfit, Hanbok. To commemorate this important day, President Bakane attended a special. Hanbok exhibition held at Korea's Presidential Museum of Sarangche in Seoul. Following that event, President Park attended an outdoor fashion show featuring more than 50 different Hanbok designs. She also had a brief encounter with a group of Chinese tourists. The president shook hands with them and encouraged them to come visit Korea again in Chinese. Starting Wednesday, the 2015 Hangang Light Festival in Tuksam Hangang Park will allow people to experience a different side to the concrete jungle they've grown accustomed to and take a break from their daily grinds. EG1 provides a sneak peek of what to expect. 
colorful graphics are splashed onto the pillar of the Cheongdam Bridge as the five-day 2015 Hangang Light Festival kicked off on Wednesday. With its history and embedded memories, Hangang, a river flowing through Seoul, is a symbolic place for many Koreans. This autumn, one of its parks is being transformed into a haven for worn-out urbanites. Organized by Seoul City's Hangang Project headquarters, the festival invites various outdoor media artists to screen videos and play music around Duksam Hangang Park. As people often visit the Hangang Park to take a break and recover from their exhausting daily lives, we thought to connect the basis of the river water with sounds and graphics to give refreshment to visiting citizens. Under the theme, The Dream of Water, the festival aims to bring out an individual's memories and allow them to take a break from their busy world. Water is the most basic component of life that, with its whims, symbolizes the happiness and hardships of life. Through such visions of life, the artists created pieces through which viewers can reminisce and reflect on their lives. After seeing the show, I could really feel what the dream of water means. It was a unique and interesting experience in the Hangang Park. On top of this, a nearby green is decorated as a garden of light with LED roses, balloons and paper boats. Visitors can also participate by making their own glowing paper boats. With today's opening, the festival is awaiting your visit until Sunday. So why not wander down and take an autumn evening stroll? Easy one. Arirang News. The winner of the 7th Chopin piano competition was announced early Wednesday morning in Poland. A very young pianist named Cho Sang-jin. Lee Soon introduces us to the first Korean to win this world-renowned competition. This is Cho Sang-jin. In the Polish capital of Warsaw on Wednesday, this 21-year-old became the first Korean pianist to win the prestigious International Frederick Chopin Piano Competition. These days I only play Chopin. I can see many things on the score. And so the Chopin competition helps the participant understand more about music by Chopin. After four hours of contemplation, the judging panel finally selected the Paris Conservatoire student from Korea over 77 other contestants from 19 countries. The concours has been held every five years since 1927 in Warsaw in memory of the Polish composer Frederick Chopin. It's one of the top three music competitions in the world. He's pretty much won every competition that a pianist needs to win. Never mind the domestic field, he was the youngest ever to win the youth Chopin competition and the first Asian to win the Hamamatsu competition in 2009. The 37,000 U.S. dollars prize money is a nice bonus. But more importantly, the young pianist Cho Songjin has achieved momentum for his musical career beginning with Wednesday night's gala show in Chopin's home city of Warsaw. Lee Soon, Arirang News. Science ministers from 57 countries have adopted a joint declaration charting the vision and guidelines for sustainable growth through science development. Dubbed the Tejan Declaration on Science, Technology and Innovation Policies for the Global and Digital Age, it deals with policies that ensure countries promote the development of science and technology in combating a wide range of issues from climate change to epidemic diseases. The statement wraps up the two-day OECD Ministerial Science Meeting in Taejeon, Korea's technological research hub, rather than its customary setting in Paris. Marty McFly traveled to the future, which was October 21st, 2015, to ride the hoverboard and get shell-shocked by 3D ads. October 21st, 2015, in other words, he traveled to today. We're talking about the sci-fi comedy movie Back to the Future, starring Michael J. Fox, of course. Our Kim ji takes us back to the past to tell us what parts of the future, what parts of the future this successful franchise got right. Three D advertisements capture the attention of pedestrians while cars whiz past in midair. This is the kind of future portrayed in the 1989 film Back to the Future Part Two, one of the popular Back to the Future trilogy. Some of the gadgets shown in the movie have already become reality, like the skateboard that floats on air. 
This Lexus hoverboard can glide while floating a few centimeters above a copper or aluminum surface, resembling the hoverboard Marty McFly uses in the movie. Also, the glasses worn by the characters to call someone or watch TV mirror the Google Glass, while video calls similar to today's Skype and FaceTime services are also depicted in the second installment of the trilogy, which generated more than 950 million U.S. dollars at the box office. Well, I when it opened, I uh, started coming up to me saying how much they loved the movie, and I, I saw that it, it uh, kind of ironically for a time travel movie, it had timelessness. It, just, mm -hmm. it existed apart from its period. It, the movie missed on some parts, though. It failed to predict the emergence of smartphones, and flying cars definitely haven't been invented yet. Kim Jo, Arirang News. And now for international headlines, we join Bruce Harrison in the News Center. Bruce? Good evening, Daniel. Many Western leaders are concerned about Syria and Russia's relationship, but it only appears to be getting stronger. All right, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad popping over to Moscow is definitely a strong proof of that fact. Uh, yeah, definitely. He apparently flew to Moscow yesterday to surprise Putin and thank the Russian leader for personally, uh, personally thank him rather, for airstrikes against Islamic State militants. The Kremlin only made the visit public today, but didn't say if Assad still in Russia. He thanked Putin for supporting Syria's unity and its independence, and he said more importantly, Russia's military supports in line with international law. And I have to say that the start of these political steps that you have been undertaking since the beginning of the crisis, they have prevented the situation from developing into a more tragic scenario. Western leaders remain skeptical over Russia's military intervention. They believe airstrikes are targeting rebel forces fighting against Assad's military. And on Tuesday, the U.S. and Russia signed a deal to minimize collisions as both countries' air forces carry out airstrikes in Syria. Chinese President Xi Jinping's all business now that his royal welcome in the UK has ended. He met the head of the UK's Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, and said the two countries should continue to strengthen ties. She said their cooperation can further benefit both countries as well as promote world peace, stability, and prosperity. He's expected to sign a number of business deals, but prior to that, he did make time for a banquet hosted by Queen Elizabeth. There, she said Britain's industrial revolution rejuvenated the world's silk and ceramics industry, and China's tea made the lives of British people more refined. While she's in London, Prime Minister David Cameron hopes to win investment in infrastructure and nuclear power. The expected flagship deals, a plan for two state-owned Chinese utilities to invest in a nuclear power project worth 16 billion pounds or more than 27 billion U.S. dollars. Iran's Supreme Leader has endorsed a landmark nuclear deal with world powers. The Associated Press reports Ayatollah Ali Khamenei endorsed the deal in a letter to Iran's president. He gave his support, but with the caution, the United States can't be trusted. The Daily reported that until now, the Ayatollah declined to publicly approve or reject the deal while expressing support for Iran's negotiators. Iran's parliament passed a bill last week supporting the deal. The agreement would curb Iran's nuclear activities in exchange for the lifting of crippling international sanctions. Western nations have long suspected Iran of pursuing nuclear weapons alongside its civilian program, but Tehran insists its program is entirely peaceful. And that's a glimpse of the world today. Have a great night. Fine dust is becoming more serious now with the concentration of fine particles going up as high as 156 microgram per cubic meter, triggering an ultra-fine dust advisory issued in Seoul for the first time this season, while alerts remain in place for other regions including Busan, Daejeon and Gwangju. And the dust and smog will persist for most parts of the peninsula tomorrow, while the eastern regions are under sporadic rain conditions with 
normal air quality. And speaking of which, a timely rain to wash away the dust is in the picture for Saturday and next Tuesday, although the amount should not be enough to make a significant difference. And similar temperature readings to repeat tomorrow under partly sunny and dusty skies. As daily high here in Seoul and Busan will hike up to 23, and Daegu and Gwangju will top out at 22 and 26. And as for the other regions, Daejeon and Jeju Island will see a high of 24 and 22. And it's going to be a chilly day in Mount Kungang where the family reunions are taking place with morning rain in the forecast. That's all for the weather. Good night. That's a wrap for us. Thank you for watching. For more updates, do tune in to our Midnight Newscast.